Hello and welcome to today's Wild Lunch Wednesday. My name is Charlotte and I will be your host today as we meet one of the Zoological Society of London's conservationists and find out more about what it's like to go on fieldwork around the coast of the UK. Before we do that though, I'm going to share my screen with you one more time to show you how you can get involved and share your questions with us. And um, Please submit any questions that you have during today's event to Pigeonhole. Just go to www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1826. That's www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1826. Two, six, and there you will be able to post your questions throughout the event. We will try and answer as many of them as we can, but I am going to be looking at the most popular questions. So please don't forget to upvote other people's questions as well, ones that you think are really good and you'd really like to know the answer to as well, because I will be looking out for those popular questions and trying to cover those as we go along. So as I mentioned, today we're going to be finding out more about fieldwork in the UK. And to tell us more, we're joined by marine conservationist Celine Gamble. Thanks so much for joining us, Celine. Thanks, Charlotte. Happy to be here. <laughs> so Celine, during Wild Lunch Wednesdays, the, the series so far, um, we've, we've been going far, far and wide. But today we're, we're closer to home, finding out about your work in the UK, um, because ZSL is involved in a lot of different projects in, in the UK, um, often focusing on our rivers and coastal environments. Um, so in three words, Celine, can you tell me what it's like to go on fieldwork in Britain? I say the first thing that probably comes to mind is that it can be quite cold. Um, of course, being based in the UK means the weather is very variable. And even with the best planning in the world, sometimes the weather can take a turn. So I would say that's the first thing that comes to mind. But I would also say that that makes it very exciting. Um, so a lot of pre preparation and build up and planning goes into kind of getting out in the field, whether that's kind of logistics and getting everyone together. So I'd say it's exciting for that reason when you're, when you're <laughs> actually there in person, it all comes to life. And then the final thing I'd say is that it's unpredictable so the opportunity for an encounter that you might not expect which I think I'm going to talk about a little bit later on. Absolutely and, and I imagine unpredictable too in terms of the weather because I know you were you were meant to be on field work sort of well round about now um, but you, you've been having all sorts of issues with the rain the cold and also the snow as well. <laughs> yeah exactly we were meant to be up in Sunderland um, a few weeks ago when the snow hit so sadly that had to change and I think it was it was for the best sitting on the edge of a pontoon in the snow would not have been the best. <laughs> no no. <laughs> Um, well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Celine. Um, we're definitely going to be covering some really exciting wildlife and, and images and encounters, as you mentioned, during today's event. Um, I said that ZSL is involved in a, a large number of conservation projects along our rivers and estuaries in the UK. And that's very much with a focus trying to um, help us restore these river and coastal habitats and the animals that, that live there. Um, in particular, we do a lot of work along the Thames, which you know anyone who's seen the River Thames often looks quite brown a bit murky it's hard to imagine that there's there's much life living in it but that's that's not the case is it Celine? Exactly so it's actually home to around 100 different fish species some which are commercially important and others very obviously ecologically important so some of those fish include um, pike sea bass and essentially it provides a really nice nursery habitat for kind of the juvenile species of those fish and also it provides a, a kind of healthy and safe environment for fish to come and spawn and lay eggs so I believe this is a European smelt um, so in our projects we also kind of do monitoring on particular species in the Thames um, Along with that, there's also, um, we found critically endangered European eel um, in the Thames and, and the kind of estuaries that come off the river. Um, and that forms an important part of our team's work in the estuaries and wetlands team um, involved with the European eel monitoring program to do with kind of removing the barriers of the areas that the, re the eels can reach. Um, there's also some apex predators in the Thames, um, which include the harbour Ooh. seal and grey seal. What um, does that, that mean, an apex predator? So the kind of the top of the food web, I'd say, so they're kind oh, of okay. pred predators um, and they're actually really good indicator species. So when you're looking at this kind of um, apex predators, you can kind of get an idea of the overall health of an ecosystem. So actually these seals here, um, we kind of monitor using um, 
cameras um, and basically can like identify their behavior and haul out behavior. Um, and yeah, it's kind of a really good indicator of the overall health of the estuary. And there's so many seals um, towards the kind of mouth of the Thames, which is where we have our instant wild cameras um, as well. Um, and yeah, in, in 2017, there was actually a really exciting um, and surprising um, sighting, which was a short snouted seahorse um, during the juvenile fish survey. Sadly, I wasn't there, very jealous, still hoping to this day that I might um, come across one once sometime. Um, but yeah, so this is a short snouted seahorse and they've actually had a few viewings of seahorse species in the Thames. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, this one was in 2017, which I think is incredibly exciting and unbelievable to think that such a kind of sensitive and um, species that is quite vulnerable to you know human pressures and that kind of thing the fact that we found one in the Thames is absolutely amazing and shows that um, it is not just grey and brown as you might once think um, it is actually teeming with life um, yeah. yeah there's some incredible wildlife just underneath the surface there um Celine your your sound we're picking up a, a a little bit of extra noise so you might want to yeah just move the mic slightly further away from your mouth you, not, any there we go we can still hear you that's that's good I was going to say we don't don't want to go to the other extreme <laughs> um wow that's amazing well Celine I, I imagine you've had quite a lot of experience um working in in various locations around the UK including the Thames for you is there a particular wildlife encounter that really stands out yeah so I would say that um my first, my best kind of wildlife encounter in the UK would be um, diving in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. um, so the, kind of the first time getting underneath um, the kind of waves and, and, and diving for the first time and kind of seeing the marine biodiversity that's under the water. So there's some images here of um, the kind of different photos that I've taken during those dives and um, including some really cool and charismatic um, species, which I think is incredible. Um, but in terms of, I think overall, the most kind of memorable was um, kind coming across a basking shark, which was in Cornwall. Um, so it came across um, this kind of huge basking shark um, whilst on a kind of like a wildlife um, boat in Cornwall. Um, and yeah, it was just fascinating. We were kind of out there for a few hours and had seen a few things, but nothing nothing as big as this. And coming across the basking shark was incredible. Um, and they're the largest shark in the UK and actually the second largest fish in our ocean um, with its relative being the whale shark. So it was absolutely incredible and kind of humbling to come across um, this basking shark. Um, and yeah, we just kind of saw it feeding um, in the waters kind of filter feeding opening its mouth really wide feeding on zooplankton and just kind of seeing that really up close was just incredible and yeah you can kind of come across basking sharks in Cornwall um, during the summer and also along the west coast of Scotland as well I think um, is also a good spot to spot them as well. Wow that that does sound like a very memorable encounter Celine and um don't forget, everybody, to keep on sending your questions in for Celine. Um, and I'll just quickly share that uh, link with you one more time. It's www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1826. Before we take um, some, some questions from our viewers, Celine, one of the other animals that can be found around British waters is the native oyster, which people probably mainly associate as perhaps seeing uh, on the menu in restaurants. But why, why are oysters actually really important in our environment? What, what are they and what do they do? Yeah, so oysters, they are sessile. Um, I've actually got a shell with me from my bathroom Ooh. that I have. Um, so they are sessile, meaning that they don't move, and they are bivalve. So they have a double hinged um, shell and they are a mollusk. Um, and they have two distinct flat kind of dorsal valve and curved central valve, so two shells coming together. And um, yeah, so basically they are um, a species that is native to the UK. They kind of look like they have a kind of pale yellow green coloration. They can grow up to around 15 centimetres in shell height. Um, they're found in the subtidal area. And um, yeah, they're basically characterised by their water filtering abilities. Um, so they, they use their valve to pump waters, uh, water across their hair like gills, um, and they basically um, filter out microscopic algae and um, sc small organic particles from the surrounding water. And so basically, I like to say that despite being quite small in size, they can have quite a 
huge impact in terms of cleaning up our coastal water quality. Mm -hmm. um, so around a single oyster can filter around 200 litres of water per day. And so when you think about the numbers of oyster that come together in a, in a kind of healthy oyster bed, which is what we're aiming to create, um, it, you've got an ecosystem that's really powerful to try and clean up um, our coastal water quality. Um, that's just one of the kind of things that they do for us. They also support uh, marine biodiversity. So on this image, you can see there's an oyster shell and it's got a kind of juvenile oyster that's actually settled on top of it. Um, and so when they come together to form these healthy kind of marine habitats, um, they actually support a range of other marine biodiversity as well. So they can create a really nice ecosystem, it's similar to when I was discussing with the Thames, a kind of nice nursery habitat that creates that healthy and um, safe space for um, fish species and all manner of different species to come and lay eggs and kind of feed and kind of keep safe within a kind of bit of sheltered habitat. So yeah, that's why we're trying to restore them. Um, and yeah, they, they, it's just a few, two of the kind of few things that they do. And um, in the projects, we like to describe them as superheroes of the sea, trying to give them a little bit of a, a name to trying to help communicate um, exactly what they can do for us. Oh, they, they definitely sound like superheroes to me because really important um, habitat um, and environment, as you mentioned, for other animals, but also that ability to to filter and, and clean the water. And we've got a video um, here, Celine. What's what's this showing? Yeah, so this video is basically a time lapse um, over a four hour period. So the tank on the left shows the clarity of the water with no oysters inside. And on the right, um, it shows the water being cleaned by around, I think, 10 to 15 um, native oysters. So I really like this um, video. Um, it's a video from our colleague um, from the Solon Oyster Restoration Project. Um, and he basically yeah, just sat and watched. Um, well, I guess he had, had a camera sat and watched the kind of impact these oysters have on and cleaning up, cleaning up the water, basically. That's that's incredible. I think that really sort of demonstrates how how effective they are at doing that, but also how quick. Exactly. Well. Yeah. Yeah. So four hours completely cleaned that tank to clear. So just shows. Yeah. Like you say, just how good they are at doing it. Absolutely. Um, well, I'm going to have a quick look to see what questions we're um, coming through. Don't forget, everybody, to keep upvoting your favourite question. Um, before we go on to that, Celine native oysters historically were found around the UK but they're now under under threat why is that yeah so the native oyster has um, faced population decline of around 95 percent since the 1950s and this is due to a range of um, reasons like you said um, disease um, they kind of face various different disease and the way that they live so closely to one another it can quickly spread um, also habitat loss the fact that the suitable habitat for them to live in is becoming lost and fragmented um, and also over exploitation so um, because people also love to eat oysters it also means that they've um, been kind of fished out and previously um, historically overfished. Um, so we do have a few remaining populations in the UK, so they can be found, um, wild populations, which can be found on the west coast of Scotland and south of England in areas such as the Solent and the River Fowl. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's just a really interesting kind of um, opportunity, obviously, that for us to kind of get involved and kind of give this species a helping hand to try and bring it back and um, I think looking at the way that it's previously been extracted kind of taking out the live oyster sometimes the shells are also gathered at the same time and actually that substrate of old shell is really important to the survivability of the species and um, so I think I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail later on when it comes to restoring it but essentially the way that we've been fishing them takes all of the shells and the live oysters out um, which is something that we're kind of trying to address through our projects. Mm. So it's not just the live oyster that you want there, it's it's those shells. Yeah, that well. substrate, because the oyster, they've, um, they yeah, like I mentioned with that image, they really like to settle on other oyster shells. So mm -hmm. they're attracted to that kind of calcium carbonate substrate where the, ba the kind of baby oysters, so oyster larvae, settle on and grow on other oyster shells and um, substrate. Brilliant. Well, um, we have had several questions coming through and I can see one of the most popular popular ones, Celine, is actually about um, sort of disease in, in oysters, which I know can can be an issue. Um, and someone has heard that um, a while ago they heard the population of oysters around Whitstable. I don't know how where you are of the, the oysters in Whitstable, so you <laughs> may not be able to answer this, but just in case um, they heard that this population had been infected with herpes. Um, are you aware of this? Is, is that correct? And if so, is it a serious problem? Yeah, so um, 
we've done a lot of kind of work and research looking into the diseases and kind of viruses that can impact um, obviously the native oyster because kind of looking into restoring the species you obviously have to look at the threats and yeah so there is a herpes virus which is the oyster herpes virus um, and so that is actually something that can impact oysters I can't comment on that particular oyster population as I'm not based there um, but I would say that as part of our work um, we collaborate with kind of restoration practitioners and scientists all around the UK to kind of gather that information all about the kind of emerging diseases and changes in disease and virus in the population. Um, and recently we actually put forward some guidance on um, kind of biosecurity regulations around oyster restoration. So we've tried to gather and put all that information together to try and help, um, you know, inform people when trying to restore the species to kind of make sure they bear in mind those implications as well. Absolutely, because I guess the last thing you'd want is for someone to perhaps be moving infected oysters from one location to, to another. Absolutely, and, and there's loads of different kind of um, bodies and agencies that provide advice and obviously um, oyster restoration is, is quite complex. There's lots of different um, licenses and permissions that you need to secure in order to actually take it out for that exact reason. You don't want to introduce something somewhere. So um, there is a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure that that doesn't happen. Brilliant. Thank you, Celine. Um, another question, which I'm sure we were going to um, be coming on to later, but we might as well cover now, um, is do you take citizen scientists to um, help and assist with some of the field work on the Thames? And if so, um, how, how do people sign up and get involved? Yes, absolutely. Obviously, things have changed slightly due to um, COVID-19 at the moment, sadly, um, but we do accept citizen scientists um, to help with the um, monitoring work that we do on the River Thames. So you can find that on our website. If you search um, ZSL um, River Thames um, Citizen Science, I'm sure it will come up and you can basically sign up to become part of a kind of group of volunteers, a pool of volunteers that we um, invite to come out with us um, and help with our field work. And that's a really, really great way of getting that hands on experience and um, seeing for yourself because I'd never this is me joining my colleague Phoebe on an outfall safari looking for um, pollution events along rivers so helping to kind of monitor when there's been a pollution event to try and improve the overall health of that river um, and I didn't have a clue what that was before I actually joined her so I would say it's a really great way of kind of um, seeing for yourself the kind of different threats that our marine environment's facing um, so that's one way in terms of the Thames work and then with our new oyster um, Wild Oysters project, which I'm going to speak about in a little moment. Um, we've also got various different opportunities to volunteer in England, Scotland and Wales because the project spans that um, remit. And um, yeah, we're basically looking for people to help us with our oyster restoration work um, and yeah, to get involved. So there's lots of different ways to get involved with our projects. Fantastic. That's, that's great to know. Well, before we find out more about this, this restoration work and how people can get involved, um, there's one more question here, um, which is all to do with wildlife distributions and change due to climate change. Um, Celine, are you, because of these changes we're, we're seeing, um, are you aware of, of what species we might start to see in the future um, inhabiting UK waters or, or is that a little bit outside of your remit? That's a very interesting question. I'd love to know. Um, I'm afraid I don't. But I, what I can say is that um, the work that we do with um, restoring and protecting marine habitats, it's all about kind of building that resilience of our coastal habitats to changes um, such as changes in the climate. So I would say that the work that we're doing with oyster restoration and other marine habitat restoration, I think it's really trying to kind of create that buffer and make sure that we protect these habitats for both the habitat itself, so the oyster, but also the species it supports um, um, to, you know, in, in the mind that obviously in the future our marine environments are changing and we really want to try and make sure that they're healthy and resilient to deal with those changes. Well, as you mentioned, Celine, the, the native oyster, it, it is under threat. It's a need of, of conservation, which is something that, that ZSL and, and others are very much involved in. Um, what exactly are you doing to try and restore, restore this animal um, to different areas around the UK? Yeah, um, so ZSL, like you said, we're involved with a number of different initiatives, along with uh, loads of different partners around the UK. Um, so we are involved with a network of practitioners, getting everyone together, heads together to try and um, come together and solve common issues. But for today, I'm going to focus on the Wild Oysters Project. Um, so that's a new partnership project between ZSL, the Blue Marine Foundation and British Marine. And our aim is to um, 
restore Britain's health, sea to health, through the restoration of the native oyster. So um, as part of the project, we've selected three sites around the UK in England, Scotland and Wales. Um, and we're basically creating these restoration hubs. Um, so in these restoration hubs, we're introducing adult oysters, so mature oysters, which will relief, release oyster larvae, so those baby oysters, um, which will reintroduce that kind of um, population into the sea. And we're also adding in substrate. So as I mentioned earlier, the oysters love to settle on old oyster shell um, and kind of grits to kind of give that really nice footing for them to settle on and grow. So we're also introducing that to the seabed as well. And then the third part of the project is a large education and um, engagement um, program as well. So we've actually developed school materials that we will be um, distributing and going into schools and delivering as well. Um, so yeah, it's a very exciting project. And I think I've got some images um, from the Solent mm -hmm. project. So the Solent Oyster Restoration Project project um, is a collaboration between the Bloomering Foundation and the University of Portsmouth and essentially the um, oyster nursery system that we're using in the wild oysters is something that was um, developed in the Solent with that project so I think I've got some photos of what those nurseries look like um, when yeah so this is us kind of measuring the oysters and kind of monitoring the oysters before they go into the nurseries and I think in the next slide I've got a yeah, I was again preparing them. And then this photo shows we've basically, um, well, in the Solent, they created these hatches in marina pontoons, which you then lower these nurseries full of oysters, mature oysters underneath that hatch. And you basically leave them under there and they reproduce um, and kind of thrive under there. And it attracts lots of different marine species, but it also, like I say, releases that larvae, which is that kind of population that we really need to help increase the numbers. And essentially um, we've, use this design um, developed by this project in this new wild oysters project so that's something that we're doing and we're working with six marinas so it's mm -hmm. a big collaboration with um, the marine industry and engaging different people um, with the project to basically install these nurseries underneath those marinas so that's what we're doing with this um, new project which is very exciting and I quite like the innovative way of using space um, and I think that's something that's really important in terms of creating that space for nature in areas that you might not expect, such as a marina. Absolutely. And, and I, I can't help but notice in, in that photo, Celine, it is dark. Do you carry out most of your field work in the dark? <laughs> not by choice, um, but in this particular instance, it was around the timing of the oysters. Um, so I think they were traveling to that site overnight. So we had to work right. um, to, to their time scale. <laughs> so not always in the light, um, just to kind of make sure that they were in the water safely at that time. Brilliant. And the, the photos before this, this one, Celine, um, they, they seem to involve a, a lot of, of measuring as well. What, what, what exactly was going on there? Yeah, so it's basically um, monitoring the oysters that are in those um, nurseries. And that's what we'll be doing as part of this a new project. Um, and that's actually something that people can help us to do. So basically, when the oysters are in there, they're a certain size. And over the kind of period of time where they're in the water, we would basically want to monitor their health, check that they're still alive, check if they're breeding um, and kind of identify those key kind of factors of, of what they're up to basically which helps kind of us inform um, restoration projects in the future and help design projects and um, really increases our understanding to then basically try and restore more oysters essentially. So you can really keep an eye an, an eye on what what's going on and, and how those those oysters are doing and and growing and and, and hopefully breeding as well. Exactly yes that's the aim. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a few more questions that have come in, Celine. So um, let's try and cover some more of those. Um, one of the questions that's come through is, in your opinion, what's one of the biggest assets of, of UK waters? Is it the habitats we have or is it some of the species that are present here? Oh, that's a tough one. If I had to choose one, I suppose, um, given the kind of topic of today, I would say I'd say our marine habitats. Um, so not just oyster, um, oyster habitat, but also seagrass beds, for example, kelp forests, salt marshes. I think they're an incredible, you know, diversity of marine habitats that we have. I, I think sometimes they're often overlooked. Um, mm. I think just because the water is not as clear as maybe the Bahamas, I think maybe they don't get as much airtime. But um, to me, I would say it's the diversity of the marine habitats that we have along our coastlines. And obviously, if you then start to look at the species they support, then I'm sure you could find um, some really exciting species there as well. 
Well, another question that's come through, um, Celine, is about um, seagrass habitats. And I'm, I'm not sure whether that's something um, you've come in contact much with, with yourself through your work. But this question is, how does the current loss of seagrass impact biodiversity in UK waters? Is, is that something you can comment on? Yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously with restoration of oysters and um, we also collaborate with um, practitioners who are working on different habitats so we do work um, and liaise with um, practitioners who are restoring seagrass um, I would say that it's, it's you know there are lots of similarities between the different habitats in terms of supporting biodiversity um, I think with seagrass it's to do with carbon sequestration and some really incredible benefits um, in that regard so I think the fact that we've lost a lot of our seagrass breads is devastating but I also know that there's a group of people that are working really hard similar to us um, to try and bring back um, the kind of yeah, seagrass beds in these locations. So yeah, I'm a big fan of seagrass beds. I, I really enjoy kind of when I snorkeling, I try and keep an eye out and see if I spot any in case I see something cool swimming in and around it. Um, but yeah. Well, hopefully today's event is going to result result in and a lot more people in in the UK trying out perhaps some snorkeling diving sticking their head under the water to to see what's there because it's amazing when you do and um, one of the other questions that we've had come through is from uh, someone who's been diving all around the world but has never been brave enough to dive in in the UK um, and they say they've seen a lot of rubbish on their dives um, and they wonder what it's like off the coast of of Cornwall when when you've been diving is rubbish a big problem? Thankfully, I've actually not come across that much rubbish in the locations that I've dived in Cornwall. Mm. Um, I would say that there's some incredible um, dive spots um, in, in Cornwall, um, some areas um, in one called Porth Keris, I'd recommend um, diving. It's just incredible. Um, and there's some really nice kind of reef structures to swim in and around, um, dive in and around. And there's also some seals that pop up and around there as well. Um, but yeah, thankfully I've not come across a whole load of rubbish, which is obviously very um, a very good thing. Um, mm. But yeah, exciting that you've dived all around the world. I'm jealous. <laughs> Definitely. Would, would you recommend diving in the UK, Celine? Is, is it very cold? <laughs> it is cold. It is cold. I did learn to dive in December in Cornwall. <laughs> so it's quite intense. Um, but I would, I definitely would recommend it. It's it's not as cold as it looks. And if you, you know, um, a summertime is a good time to try it out. And I'm sure, you know, there's incredible dive spots all around the UK. I know also areas in North Wales, there's some incredible, incredible dive spots that I would highly recommend. <laughs> well, um, you, you mentioned as part of, of your project, this work with native oysters, one of the other things you're trying to do is, um, is do something about that, that loss of substrate, the loss of um, all of the old oyster shells, which are so important to their survival. Um, how do you go about doing that and, and restoring that? How, where, yeah. I mean, do you have to try and find lots of old oyster shells from somewhere absolutely so it's a good opportunity to talk about our project in Essex so the Essex Native Oyster Restoration Initiative and I've got some images of them restoring some of that substrate um, <laughs> in that area so in Essex there's a restoration box and essentially they identified that they needed to introduce more substrate to that particular environment so here um, there is a barge um, with a um, a kind of skip full of this that substrate so um there's various different types of substrate you can use including that old oyster shell um and you basically yeah they're dropping onto the seabed this helps kind of elevate um the seabed and then eventually i think they've put some oysters on top of that as well so it basically lifts the oysters off the seabed which provides a much more optimal habitat for them to live and survive in and yeah it, i think uh, to me it looks amazing seeing a crane um kind of in the middle of the ocean sadly i wasn't there but these are some photos from our colleague matt and i know that it was very exciting and um a lot of planning involved with this and in in um i do know that in essex they actually recycle some of their shells that they use for that have been Used for food um, so once someone's eaten an oyster they save the shell and then um, kind of store them up and try and use that shell as um, substrate again brilliant cycling going on there that's good. That's what that's what we like to hear. Well, we are coming towards the end of the event, uh, but what we're going to do is I'm going to take the top five most popular remaining questions and ask them to Celine after the event, and then we'll post the answers in a blog tomorrow on our website. So 
please keep on upvoting so that we get to answer your favorite question. But just to um, finish up, uh, Celine, we've got one more um, question here, which I think is a nice one to finish on. Um, and it is, what animal would you most love to see while out on field work in the UK that you haven't seen before? Ha have you seen everything? Or is there something you'd, you'd still definitely. love to spot? <laughs> definitely, definitely not seen everything. There's still so much to see. Um, I would say that my colleagues who came across that seahorse, I was incredibly jealous of. So that's what springs to mind. But second to that, um, I would actually love to go diving and see an oyster because although I've been working on oysters, I've seen lots of live oysters. I've actually never seen one um, whilst diving and on the seabed. So um, I think that would be an amazing opportunity. And this photo was actually taken by a diver that um, entered one of our competitions. So we, we worked with divers to try and find a good photo of a native oyster under the water. Because a lot of the time we've got the photos of them outside the water so for me I think coming across um something an image like this underwater I think I'd be blowing bubbles underwater and being squealing with excitement so that's what I would that's what I'd like to see oh brilliant well I very much hope that you get the chance to to go out diving again soon Celine and and find yourself a, a native oyster thank you so much for for joining us today and telling us more about your work and thank you to all of you for your questions as well they've been absolutely brilliant and as I mentioned we will answer uh, the top five remaining questions on a blog and we will post that tomorrow um, before you go though uh, we really welcome your feedback we'd love to know what you thought of today's event so please please do just take a few minutes to go to surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash wild lunch to tell us what you thought of today's event and perhaps what you'd like to see us covering in the future. So that's surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash wild event. Um, sorry, wild lunch. Uh, wild lunch Wednesdays uh, take place uh, fortnightly on a Wednesday um, so we do have a few more coming up we're extending the series into April so in two weeks time at the end of the month we're going to be keeping it aquatic and um, keeping it marine but this time going to the Indian Ocean to find out about field work there so please join us then make sure you don't miss it by subscribing to our YouTube channel and we hope to see you again soon thank you bye <laughs>